Thank you, everybody. It's great to be back here again. As Sagar said, uh, it seems like it was just like that that we were doing this last year already. Time flies so quickly. And um, this being Christmas season, uh, we're going to be having our all-day meditation tomorrow. And our up at, we're having, if you're interested, you're welcome to come to Pune also, because next week we're going to be doing this at the city center on Sunday. And the following week, we're going to be doing it at the ashram out on the land. So we have three in a row. If you're motivated, you're always welcome to come. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, this reading today, or I, with the reading. As I mentioned prior to the chanting, I took as my theme today light. This is very significant because Christmas has this outward side to it. But in many ways, it's very symbolic. As you know, time goes by and symbols end, end up being outwardly expressed in stories and historical events and so on. But underneath it, particularly when you have a great master who was incarnated at that time, and Paramahansa Yogananda said Jesus Christ was a self-realized master, that when an end, uh, he came as a liberated soul, so that would technically classify him also as avatar, that whenever you have such a great one coming, they come for a purpose. They don't come haphazardly. Uh, nothing in this life, of course, is haphazard. There's a, but they come with a special divine purpose. No karmic compulsion pulls them into this world. And so uh, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ, Christ is merely a title, the, uh, came with, uh, with also with a mission, a world mission that uh, uh, to redeem, as you might say, souls. And, and, but this, you have to understand these on multiple levels, as it is with any of the stories. If you, you go back to the life of Krishna, there's an outward, but there's also a, symbol, a symbolism that's taking place at that time as well with those stories. So I'm going to start with a reading. This is a, this is a reading from the Old Testament Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, and that it was good. And God divided the light into the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And then from the book of Ezekiel. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east. And behold, the glory of God of Israel came from the way of the east. And his voice was like a noise of many waters. And the earth shined with his glory. Now, anyone who has a cursory knowledge of mystical literature knows that what is the east when we speak of what is the east of the body the east of the body is here this is this is the east of the body north of the body is here east of the body is here so he came he was shining the light shine in the east and he was looking toward the east at that point and then from the Bhagavad Gita from the 16th or fifth chapter for whom that darkness of the soul is chased by light, splendid and clear, shines manifest the truth, as if a sun of wisdom sprang to shed its beams of light. You find this referenced many times. Uh, there's hundreds in the Bible, and also you find in the Gita also there's references to light and spiritual literature and light. And what is this light that's being talked about, and what, is it, what does it have to do with Christmas also. Well, Christmas is really a symbol of the birth of that light. Christ came as an avatar, and you could say that symbolizes the birth of that light within each one of us. Christian dogma, of course, you have the inner mystical teachings of the Bible, but then you have the outer, you might say the outer form that it takes in terms of church. And Christian dogma says that in order for us to have salvation, we must be redeemed in Christ. We must be redeemed in Christ. 
Now, Paramahansa Yogananda said, actually, that's true. And we must, you know, we must uh, uh, redeemed in the, with the Son of God, Jesus Christ being the Son of God. That's a Christian dogma. But interestingly, when I, when I grew up uh, outside, I had no religion when I grew up. I was in a Christian country, but I wasn't Christian. Uh, but uh, so I thought, mm, I don't, you know, I didn't accept that. But I was very surprised when Jesus, when Paramahansa Yogananda said, actually, that's true. But it's not understood. It's not understood. It's true on the deeper sense, that in the sense that we must be redeemed in Christ. But that Christ isn't a person. That Christ isn't a man. That Christ, that Christ is the Kutashta itself, that light of the Christ consciousness, that light of the Kutushka, Kutashta consciousness, that light of the Krishna consciousness that is manifested here at this point in the, in the uh, we can see in the spiritual eye. This is, this, this is the true light of Christ and we must be redeemed in that. Now redeemed mean we must cast, to, we must be purified in that light. We must cast our ignorance into that light. And where does ignorance reside? Ignorance is the darkness, you see. There's the light, and then you have the darkness. And what is the darkness? Darkness is ignorance. It's not, uh, it's not a fellow with a pointy tail and, you know, a little... <laughs> it's, it's ignorance. It's ignorance. And we see ignorance all the time. But really, what is ignorance but the absence of light? It's really the darkness. Darkness has no reality of itself. Darkness is merely what happens when there's no light. And it, but, but it's just the light itself that's the dynamic uh, aspect. But when that light's not there, we have ignorance. But that ignorance, too, is represented within us. The light is here of the Christ consciousness, that consciousness of the Kutashta here. But ignorance is here, the ego. The ego, that sense that we are separate from God. We are separate that we somehow live outside of divinity. We, don't, we're, we have our own individuality. That ego consciousness is representation of the darkness. And we must cast forward, redeem that ignorance by casting it forward and into the light of the spiritual eye. Now, in yogic terms, what we have is this is the Agya Chakra, and it has two poles. It has a positive pole here, the point between the eyebrows, has a negative pole here at the, at the medulla oblongata. And it's said that this is the seat. The medulla is the seat of ego. Think about it. The ego, it, it, it controls the breath. It controls the heart. It controls all of these things that pushes the body, or the, our awareness of the body, out into the senses. It's controlled from there. And we sense of this is where we sit, this sense of I resides in ego consciousness. But that ego consciousness must be redeemed. It must be offered up into the light of the Christ consciousness, into the light of the Kutashta. And that is truly what true baptism really is, is the offering ourselves up into that light. And so when, when Paramahansa Yogananda said, yes, that's true. And of course, he meant true, but not in the way the church might say it might mean that. But I think if, if a person is a saint and has deep understanding, we understand these, even east or west, because these are universal principles. We, we must offer ourselves up into that Son of God, which is what's said to be Christ. This is what the church says, the Son of God. But they have little understanding beyond the outward form. That Son of God is the only reflected Meaning that kutashta, that light of the Krishna consciousness here, is the only is the reflection of that light of God that is referenced in the beginning. There was the light, and it's reflected. And that when an avatar comes into the world, it's an expression you could say of that light. It's a manifestation of that light that is reflected there, or that is seen there at the spiritual eye. Lahiri Mahashai, if you read his diaries, speaks again and again and again of man's necessity. You're so, you might say, to simplify it, 
man has but one duty in life and is to put himself, his consciousness, into the kutashta, the sent into the spiritual eye, and to reside there. To transfer, in other words, what he's saying is to transfer the consciousness of who and what we are from our sent little self up into that light. And in residing in that spiritual eye, through meditation, through Kriya Yoga, to see that light and to look into that light is the whole essence of what spiritual sadhana is about. All of the practices, pranayams, techniques, chanting, meditation, ritual, all of it, all of it has that as its goal, is to transfer our sense of awareness up into the light of the kutashta, up into the light of the Krishna consciousness. And so as we meditate tomorrow, you might keep that in mind. Look into that light. Try to draw that light to you. Mother, come out of the darkness. Bathe me in that light. Bathe me in that. And in that light, all darkness is washed away. All, you might say, problems that we have in life are washed away. This is why Lahiri Mahashai said, he says, if you want to solve your problems in life, all problems are solved through the practice of Kriya Yoga. And why is that? It's because Kriya Yoga has for its direct result and its true purpose is to bring the life force inside and uplift that up into the spiritual eye and to help us to be able to see that light. Or, to, or if you don't see the light, some people, you to hear the sound of Om. This is the whole purpose of what we, why we practice. This is not just Kriya, it's why we do any religious ritual. It's the end result of to bring our consciousness from here to here, to offer ourselves, to be redeemed into the light. And this is one real, it doesn't matter if it's Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, or what, Islam, whatever, this is underneath. But of course, only the saints, you see, really understand that on the deeper level. On, outside of that, people argue. <laughs> and of course, it's because they see it from the outside. But this was the meaning also, the symbol of Christ's life. And I'd like to just read another little passage. And this is from the New Testament uh, about, uh, about Jesus. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah? For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring, him, bring word back to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced, and with exceedingly great joy, uh, and, and, and with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. 
It's a famous story, of course, three wise men. And of course, of course, the master said that those wise men came from the east. They came from the east, Persia, India, this direction. And that in the later years that Christ actually, Jesus went back to the east in those lost years, you could say, of, of from the Bible that don't recount that part of his life, paid a return visit back to the east to learn from them and then ultimately came back to the to his homeland to carry out what would be his mission and, but uh, carrying back with him a universal teaching a very deep teaching of of awakening that star in the east the wise men they saw that star in the east of course its reference is they were following that inner guidance of that inner wisdom that inner that inner apparition of or manifestation of this uh, this uh, kutashta that was shining there and they followed that intuition until it came and brought them to uh, uh, and to to uh, where Christ was born and they recognized it as a sign of the descent of divinity into this world it's a sign of in other words the descent of an avatar and this is why they traveled so far because it was a very significant event of which they intuitively understood the meaning of and they came to to give honor to that descent of the divinity into the world now historically people will debate forever you know the the literalness or the or the figurativeness of whether of this story but what it represents to us is it represents the awakening you could say it's it represents in story form the awakening of this divine consciousness within us you see we the light needs to be born christ needs to be born within us and you could say each we we celebrate that it's the divine awakening that takes place within us but you could say even when inspiration or any uplifting thoughts we're awakening that as you could say uh, as like Swami Kriyananda said anytime you have a positive thought there's a spark an uplifting upward movement of life force within the spine but in a more significant way the it represents the awakening of that divine consciousness of the Christ consciousness to touch the consciousness within us and we worship that we give it gifts we give it our very selves we offer we offer to it uh, who and what we are to that to awaken that light to be drawn up and and so in story form in symbolic form this represents a very great truth which each one of us you could say annually at this time of year we bring it to mind consciously we bring it to mind outwardly and ritualize this process that needs to take place that must take place and you could say eventually will take place within each one of us because it is our divine destiny I think also this image of awakening the light reminds me of uh, that phrase that Paramahansa Yogananda used to use and that Swami Kriyananda put into song form he says he says you can't drive out the devil with a stick in other words what you need is light and it's in other words all of us have faults if we just take this in a very uh, mundane way all of us have faults and negativity and we can't beat it out of ourselves or you can't beat it out of somebody else either you, what you need to do is bring light and I think this is if we look at the world today is there darkness in the world I think you could have to say yes there's some there's some dark there's some dark spots in this world and outwardly we see darkness but if we look within ourselves we see there's darknesses there as well we're not always shining perhaps as we would like to but you can't drive it out with a stick within yourselves you have to you can perhaps sometimes you can hold it at bay but the real cure for darkness is light and we have to bring light and I think each of us have to be instruments for that light of Christ consciousness the kutashta whatever it, we call it 
we have to be active instruments of that light. And it begins with each one of us. I remember there was a story from the life of a great saint, a Sufi saint. Her name was Rabia al-Basri. Uh, she lived in what's now Iraq. And uh, quite a many centuries ago, I don't know when, but uh, uh, there was a story from her life. And she was a great saint, people who came to her, but a, but a simple woman. And a group of her students were with her at one time. And one of them asked her, said, Mother, do you love God? And of course, what's she going to say? She says, yes, I love God. I love God. Because she was known for her great love, you see. I love God. And it's, then the student says, another one said, do you hate do you hate Satan, the devil? She says, no, I don't hate Satan. I have no space within my heart for hatred. Love so consumes me that there's no spot left to hate anything. And I thought, that's, that's good. I like that because that's how we want to be. There's, if you love, there's, or you could say, let's take in the theme that we have chosen today. If we have light, there's no space for darkness to be there. You don't have to worry about the darkness, uh, you know, beating it and, and uh, rushing after it. it. What happens if it's like Swami song, if he says, or his people are so consumed, they must, they must worship the darkness. They're talking about it all the time and running after it, you know, but he says, turn on the light in your life. And you find that the darkness begins to recede in many ways. And that's put your focus there. Because what, what we worship, as the Gita says, those who go you know, to, the, to worship me, come to me. Those who worship the lesser gods, that's to whom they go to. And what is it that, what is worship? Worship is to where you put your attention. Money, fame, uh, ego, uh, sense pleasures, wherever we're putting our, that's where we're worshiping and that becomes our God. Worship the light and to the light we will go. And think of it even in this way, we were, I was thinking, we were just doing an astral ascension ceremony just an hour or so ago. Final exam is coming for all of us. Isn't it exam time now? Is it exam time now? I know uh, somebody's, we were visiting somebody that uh, we had to, uh, time our visit because the, uh, the son was studying. Well, we are all studying for the final exam, and which will come who knows when, not scheduled, when we least expect it. And this is, and when that time comes, if we can look into the light and go to the light, we'll find that our salvation comes. But you can't wait until the last moment because uh, unless we practice, and this is what we do when we meditate. We meditate, this is what we do, and we should when we go to temple, we, you know, we should go, we, we're practicing, bringing our, why do you bow? You bow, when you bow, you release the tension in the ego, and you bring it forward to the, to the point between the eyebrows. This is what you're doing, just it's physically embodied, in what we do. And this is, I bow to you. I offer up the little self to the higher self. And this is what we do in life. And this is what we need to practice in everything we do. And so, for those of us who are on the path of Kriya Yoga, take time. And this is what we do in the Christmas season. We do at least once a year, but we shouldn't make it just once a year. Let's do it, you know, at least some, to some degree, even uh, regularly. Take time to consciously say, yes, I'm going to bring, I want to bring that light into my life. Bring, and I want to try to see that spiritual eye. And remember what Lahiri Mahashai said, see that light, live in that light, and everything else will take care of itself. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about the little things. Go into that light. All problems will be solved if we can learn to reawaken that light and may the 
light of that Christ consciousness be born within each of us every day of our life, not just on Christmas or in the season or Diwali, which is also, by the way, <laughs> we can go into the talking about light, not just on those holidays, but in every day of our life, let it be a Christmas or a Diwali to reawaken and offer ourselves into that light. Many blessings.